Hi, I'm Will, and today we are going to be making a master copy drawing. So what is a master copy? Essentially, it's what it says it is on the tin. It's the copy of the work of a master. Um, it's not going to be a forgery, in case anyone's starting to think of the millions they could make, uh, but it's a tool that goes right back to the beginnings of what we now think of as the art world. Up until the 19th century, the way most artists trained was through an apprenticeship. They would be assigned to a master, and that master would teach them all the processes of making artwork. And a big part of this would be doing a master copy. They would be given a drawing or a painting done by the master, and expected to copy it as accurately as they possibly could. This is partly to teach observational drawing, but at the time it was also to teach the student to work in the master's style, so that they could assist with commissions and larger work. Nowadays, of course, we're not trying to teach people to all draw in the same way. But master copying still has a lot to teach us, and we can learn a lot about the way that other artists have worked simply by copying what they've done. So it doesn't need to be exact, and it doesn't even really need to be a copy of a full work. In fact, today, I'm going to be copying this figure here from this painting by El Greco. So first up, we're going to talk about the tools. We've got uh, paper here to draw on, a pencil. I'm going to be using a 2H because that provides a nice light line for the beginning. We've got our image here and we've got an eraser just in case mistakes happen. Uh, all of this has been set up with table easels just to make this a bit easier uh, for you guys to see but you don't need to do it this way uh, and you can even work off a computer screen if you can't print things out. One tool that I do have um, that I think is worth using is a viewfinder. This is basically just a stiff piece of card with a hole cut out in the middle uh, and this is seven centimetres by ten centimetres uh, because that's roughly the ratio of an A4 piece of paper but you don't need to do that you could do it in whatever ratio is going to work for you so the first thing I'm going to do I put some little uh, daubs of my uh, putty eraser on and I'm going to stick this onto my image and I'm just trying to frame up as much of the that figure that I want to do as possible and what we'll do is we'll just edit out any bits that we don't want like uh, this portion of the face here and the, the ape in there So now that we've got everything in place, we're going to get started with the drawing. The way I like to do this is I like to start with points that intersect with our frame. As you can see, I've drawn round the inside of the viewfinder on the piece of paper, and so that means that this rectangle I'm going to work in is exactly the same size as this viewfinder rectangle that we're looking at here. One of the easiest ways in the beginning to do this, if you want to be very accurate, is to take measurements with your pencil. So I can see that the, the line of the shoulder is going to hit the frame roughly there. So if I want to make a really accurate measurement, I'll take my pencil, I'll line the lead up there with the point that it intersects, I'll line my thumbnail up with the top of the frame, and then when I transfer it over, I know that that mark is going to be roughly there. That's a really, really good way to get very accurate measurements right at the beginning of doing this process. But as you go on, it's a lot, e a lot better to make the measurement and mark yourself by eye and then go back and measure it and see whether or not you've got it right. If you measure everything every single time, you don't learn the spatial awareness that's going to help you when it comes to doing work from life. So I'm just going to make a few wee marks just to get a rough idea of where things are going. So I've got a few intersection points now. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to start thinking about the angles um, that forms take. The real key to doing this sort of thing is to stop thinking about what you're looking at and start really seeing what you're looking at. Um, that sounds a bit complicated, but one of the, the best ways to learn observational drawing is to teach your brain to start seeing things as abstract shapes. So when I'm drawing in this shoulder here, I don't think to myself I'm drawing a shoulder. All I'm thinking about is the angle that that shoulder makes and where it intersects with the head. So what I'm going to do is I know that the angle is roughly like that. So I'm just going to put in a line that goes up like that. It doesn't need to go bang on to where the head is because we can always work back and, uh, and make adjustments.
here and I'm thinking about the angle of the, the jaw there. I'm not thinking about drawing a jaw, I'm just thinking about what angle does it make and laying that in. And again, we're doing this in the 2H pencil because that will allow us to go back and make corrections if we see something we don't like. And really, it doesn't need to be more detailed than this. There's no point in worrying too much about getting real fine detail down at the beginning because you can always make changes. There's a sort of assumption in, uh, in the art world, or certainly for people when they're learning, that you need to nail it first time. It's not true at all. No one ever did. So don't worry about that. Just worry about getting your angles in, getting them checked, getting your distances checked. And the painting or drawing will kind of just do itself at that point. With a hand here, I'm not stressing out about getting these individual figures, fingers in. Uh, I don't really care about that at the moment. All I care about is getting the rough angles and forms, that's it. We've got a wee candle here. And I'm also bearing in mind relationships to other things. So I know that the candle ends roughly in line with where that kind of arch of the eye socket is. So I know up on my drawing here, that's where I'm roughly going to put that. So I'm going to now make sure that my candle runs to that point. Again, this isn't about perfection. It isn't about forgery. It's about doing the best you can. Uh, and I didn't start out doing these well. It took a long time to get to the point where I felt comfortable enough to do them on camera. When it comes to curves, don't stress out about getting them um, wonderfully curved in the beginning. It's actually a lot better to do things in straight lines. You can go back and round them out. Um, and the straight lines and thinking in that angular way is going to really help to get everything just the way you want it. What I'm going to do with this hairline here, as you can see, in reality, we know the hairline would sort of extend all the way beyond here, come down into a wee side bum here or something, look back behind his ear. But because all this is in shadow, that's all I care about. All I'm interested in is defining those shadow shapes at the moment. I'm not bothered about whether or not his hair looks real. The more you try and draw something real, the less real it comes out. It's one of those paradoxes. And you'll notice I kind of jump around a lot. Um, and that's just a stylistic thing. It's just the way that I work. You don't have to do that. You could stick in the one spot, really get it nailed, really get happy with it. I like to try and get the main masses and main forms in because it helps me to see everything in relation to everything else. Again, I'm blocking these fingers rather than defining them. Exactly, I'm just getting a rough idea of where they run to and a rough idea of the shape around that hand. You see there's a sort of trapezoid type shape going on. So with a bit of uh, drawing and a bit of time, we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Um, as you can see, I've kind of defined all the main forms um, and I've also put in um, lines that indicate where a lot of the shadow and highlight shapes are. <clears throat> At this point, we've got it refined where we know where everything's going to go. Um, I'm quite happy with it, so we're going to get on to the, the shading. There's a couple of approaches to this. Um, you can go for an end-on sort of cross-hatching approach, where you make lots of little lines, and then to darken, we just go back across. Um, this lends itself quite well to pen and ink work. Um, particularly if you contour it, and by contouring I mean move the line around the form. So if we were going to shade in on an arm here like this, we would make our marks in that kind of fashion. And then we would just add in some straights to the bits that we wanted to be dark. 
Um, however, for this, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going for the classic old sort of block shading style, and that's just having the pencil fairly flat and just shading in. I'm actually going to use an HB pencil. I've got pencils here that go all the way uh, from 2H up to 6B. Um, but I'm going to start with the HB because it's a lot easier to go lighter, uh, sorry, to go darker than it is to go lighter. Once you've done something dark, quite difficult to get white back. So I always find it pays to start out too light and then we can get darker as we go along. If you want to be extra careful, you can tape around the edges of your drawing with a bit of masking tape and that will help to prevent you coming out the edge. I'm just going to try and be as careful as I can at the moment. Uh, so I'm switching over to uh, the 2B I think I'll go for while we do this really dark bit. I'll probably go over this again at the end uh, using a 4B or possibly even a 6B um, and get it really dark. We don't want to create too much of a sharp edge, there is a little sharp halo there, uh, but we want to kind of blend it a little bit just to make it look slightly more natural. I'm going to do the same, same tone. And it's always pays to start top left if you're right-handed because that way especially if you're working on the flat you're not going to smudge your drawing so. and that dark as you can see it comes all the way down and I've treated all of this in my drawing as just one form, one shadow form. We've got a little, little sliver of ear there that we're going to leave. So we can see here rather. And as you can see, I'm doing this very, very lightly again in the beginning. I know I keep saying this, but it does bear repeating that the lighter you start out, the easier it is to make corrections, especially when you're beginning this stuff, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. Everyone makes a lot of mistakes. I made loads of mistakes when I started doing it. So you wanna do it as light as possible for as long as possible. So you, even if you get right to the end and you notice, ah, something's not right, you've got a bit of leeway to go back and fix it if you really wanna get it as accurate as possible. Having said that, sometimes it's nice to keep mistakes around. Um, I've got a loft full of paintings that are complete rubbish that I keep because you learn from it. If there's something right in it, even if the rest of it's wrong, keep hold of it. Because when you go back and look, you'll see the right thing first. And then you'll look again and you'll see the wrong thing and you'll realise how to achieve what you really wanted to achieve without that wrong element. So obviously this stage would take quite a long time. So once we've got the main blocks of tone in, I'll then go back and I'll make corrections, changes, darkened sections that need darkened, lightened sections that need lightened if they indeed need it, although I'm hoping that I won't have to do that. And after quite a lot of work and a couple of hours, we will end up with something that looks a bit like this. And that's obviously one I prepared earlier in a time-honoured fashion. Um, as I said, we're not going for a perfect copy. We're just going for a way of understanding the way that the artist has made the work. And uh, in this case, trying to get an understanding of the balance between light and shade and the differences in tone. So that's it. Uh, find a picture you love. Find a cereal packet you can cut a rectangle out of and make yourself a master copy.